Good morning. Happy MLK weekend. Uh, it's good to see all of you. Welcome to uh, First Church Over. I'm Lou, one of the pastors here. And uh, whether you're here in person or you've joined us online, it is good to be together. Uh, and we're in a second week, as Pastor Craig shared, of our series, Reassembly Required. And so last week, Pastor uh, Craig kicked us off by sharing the kind of the theme verse for this series out of Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It says this, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And as we encounter people, as we interact, uh, we can get derailed uh, from that kind of attitude, that mind of Christ, uh, in our relationships with others as we uh, dig into the, the C4 we talked about, those explosive tools that we tend to use, where we convince people. We convict, we coerce, we try and control these uh, relational management tools that we fall into. And, and these uh, tools bring, uh, create, bring and create huge relational problems uh, with those that we uh, encounter every day, those that we're close to and those that we barely know. And, and we may be using those tools in even real subtle ways without even knowing it. And so either way, whether uh, you know you're using these management tools, you're trying to manage relationships, you're trying to, uh, to make people do what you want them to do, or you're on the receiving end, I think this week will be helpful as we prepare ourselves to, to see some of the warning signs. And so this morning, let's uh, center ourselves as we pray together. God, we ask this morning as we gather as a body of believers, as we hear your word as you speak to each and every one of us. God, clear our, our minds of distraction. Open our hearts to those around us that we have had trouble being in relationship with. And God, we know it is through you, through the example of Jesus, that we can do all things, that we can find reconciliation, we can rebuild, we can reassemble what has been broken. It's your name I pray. Amen. So we talked last week, as you know, uh, things that, uh, that require assembly. Uh, we just went through Christmas, and maybe you had to assemble lots of things, bikes and toys and all that. But the things that we purchase, uh, that we put together, they have instructions, right? Uh, they have assembly instructions. Uh, they have uh, helpful things uh, like troubleshooting guides, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but when we're talking about our own relationships, uh, we don't always come with instructions. Um, I wish I could hand my instructions on how to deal with me to someone when I first meet them. I'm sure you would like to do the same, right? And uh, those instructions are helpful. And, and I was thinking, uh, when Melissa and I first got married, uh, I did not come with instructions. Um, and so when we first got married, uh, I left the life I had made in South Florida, in Boca Raton. Uh, my wife, uh, future right, wife, as we were getting ready, she left the life she had built in Port Charlotte, and we found ourselves as newlyweds starting our own life together, not knowing anybody in Bradenton, Florida. And uh, we were in the t what I would describe as the tiniest apartment ever created, right? This little tiny hole-in-the-wall apartment. Uh, I was unemployed, uh, which I know this sounds really good, like she really stepped into it, right? Uh, but I was unemployed at the time. I was in this tiny apartment, and we had very little furniture between us. In fact, when we first got married, we were on an air mattress on the floor. Maybe you've experienced this, right? You didn't have a dresser, but you had really nice stacks of clothes, kind of where you get, get, get dressed. And so we decided uh, not too long after that we needed some furniture. And so we went to this magical place, this new place that had opened called Ikea. Okay, have you ever heard of Ikea? Some of you are having some flashbacks right now. And so we went to Ikea, and it was this amazing place. You walk through, and you see all the beautiful furniture, the different sets that you can't pronounce the names, right? And you go through, and you see, man, it would be great if we had this, great if we had that. You could sit on furniture. You could lay on beds, all that. And so we went through this magical place, and I had no idea that the, at the end of this magical trip, when we literally furnished our entire apartment, right, in one day, we bought everything, dressers, desks, chairs, uh, entertainment centers, I mean, everything you could possibly imagine. Then when we would get to the checkout line, they would hand us these flat pack boxes that required total assembly. Maybe you've built some Ikea furniture, you know what I'm talking about. And so uh, we had this experience where we uh, went to Ikea, it was this magical thing, and then we got all these boxes that we had to drag home, unpack, and go through the directions. And, 
And it was one of those experiences that required complete assembly. And for our relationship, maybe a little bit of reassembly afterward. Maybe you've had that experience. And I want to encourage you, if anybody's looking for pre-marital counseling tests, putting together IKEA furniture is a pretty good way to gauge if you're going to make it, right? And so uh, we talk about these uh, C4 things that happen, right? We convince, we convict, we coerce, and we control. These are the toolkits that we normally go to. And, and IKEA has its own tool. Uh, it's known as the relational hand grenade. Maybe you've used it. It's the IKEA wrench. Have you seen this? I've, I've enlarged it here. Um, and the only reason I found this is because I didn't need it uh, for this weekend, right? But this a little tool, uh, the great news is it only comes with one, right? So you have to share the joy. You got to pass it back and forth if you're doing this as a team. And this tiny tool, even though it gets lost all the time, can make a huge impact. And uh, when you're building something that has all the parts, right? IKEA has all these parts and nuts and bolts. Uh, one little tiny wrench that puts everything together. You have instructions. You have all those things. But unfortunately, when it comes to reassembling relationships, that we don't have instructions. We're missing a ton of that. And so here's what I want you to hear as we go through this series. That reassembling relationships is a learned skill. You could maybe read a book. You could maybe, uh, you know, do a Google search. But it's something you either need to see modeled. We don't really live in a world where this is kind of modeled to us. We live in a world where people hold grudges, right? That, that, that there's not a lot of uh, rebuilding of relationships that we see maybe in our family system, in our work uh, encounters, that kind of thing, in our friendships. But it's something that's learned. And so you either, either need to see it modeled or you need to do it, right? You just need to try and navigate. And when you step into it, you learn very quickly that there are things you can control and things you cannot. And usually they're the opposite of what you would prefer, right? You would love to control the other things, you control the other ways in that encounter, but it's not up to us. And, and we're all better at assembling things, putting things together, including relationships, but we're, we're not that great. We can start them, we can enjoy them, but we're not that great at fixing them. And so when relationships break, when things get awkward, when there's silence or distance, when your fingers begin to hurt, possibly bleed, twisting this wrench with your partner, we don't know what to do. We, we don't know what the next step is, but that doesn't stop us from trying something, right? We always try something. And we usually do the wrong thing. And, and oftentimes, uh, when we're not sure what we do, we dig for those traditional and intuitive ways, those tools that we uh, can easily grab onto that we talk about in the C4. We try and convince people. We try and convict them. We try and coerce and control them. These are the ways that we try and manage people around us. And we do this because we are crazy. Right? We're crazy. Those things don't work on us. And so why would they work on other people, right? I, I don't like to be convicted. I don't like to be coerced. I don't like to think people are trying to control me. But yet, those are the things that we try our best to do when relationships are struggling. And chances are we all kind of have a go-to. Maybe we've used all of these. I think most of us in some way, shape, or form has, have used them. But maybe there's like a go-to that we really think, this is my first tool I grab. Maybe we're uh, into convincing that if I could just get in front of you, if I could get in front of you, I could give you all the information, I could give just a ton of stuff to you, and you're going to say this. You're going to say, oh, I'm now convinced. I was wrong. You were right, Right? And then our relationship is just going to go back to normal. We're going to be perfectly fine, right? We, we, we have these tools we lean into, and the outcome is ridiculous. Or maybe uh, convicting is a, a, a pattern we fall into or a pattern that we've experienced. And it sounds like this. It's this shame and blame game. We hear things like, after all I've done for you, after all the opportunities I've given you, after all the money I've loaned you, after all the things I've put up with, we just go through this list of all the things that the other person has done and that you've done for them. And, and you're going to feel so ashamed and guilty, you're just going to melt. And our relationship will go back to normal, it'll be restored, and it'll be fine. And this is crazy because it never happens that way. And, and maybe we coerce and control, which are 
kind of two sides of the same coin, right? We try and control those around us. We get them to do what we want them to do the way we want them to do it. Now, all I do, it feels like rejection. It feels like there's always something wrong with you, that, that your ideas are never good, that that you're the one that keeps messing up, that, that you're the one that just can't quite make the cut and you're dragging the other person down, right? It's this idea of rejection. And you know what's poisonous to relationships is rejection. It's, it's poisonous even when we're right, and that's the really tough thing. Even when we're convincing uh, with all the right information, all the right reasonings, even when we're coercing, trying to get them to move in the right direction, even when we're controlling in their best interest. Maybe you've had that experience as well. In our minds, it's rejection. It closes our hearts. It closes us off to people. They're no longer accessible to us emotionally. They're no longer in a healthy relationship with us. And this is why it's so crazy, because it undermines the one thing we want in relationships, right? Influence. We want people to hear us. I, I don't know about you, but, uh, but I want people to like me for me. Maybe you feel the same. I want agenda-free in my relationships. I, I want to feel accepted, and, and we want to be reconciled. We want our relationships to work. And we don't like the tension that comes. We don't like living with guilt, and we don't like pretending. See, the main reason we have so much tension when it comes to this kind of stuff is even if we're justified in being angry with someone or, or the things that we're trying to get them to do, the truth is this. We are only as happy as our core relationships are healthy. I'll say it again. We're only as happy as our core relationships are healthy. And this is sort of like a, a happiness factor that exists in our world. We're never any happier than our core relationships. And, and we know this from our family history. Maybe you're thinking of a family dynamic right now. Uh, we know this, that, uh, that, that when it comes to broken relationships, especially our core ones, those in the closest circle around us, that if they're not healthy, it takes a toll on us. It takes a toll on us mentally, emotionally, and eventually it'll show up in physical ways as it turns into stress in our body. And so in this process, I want you to, to remember this. So we're, we're tackling this series and we're, we're focusing on how can we reassemble these broken relationships. And I think with, with anything we're dealing with people, healthy expectations are really important. And so I want you to hear this. Before we dive into reassembly, before we try and repair those broken relationships with another person, we need to know the goal of reassembly. The goal of reassembly is actually not reconciliation. It's not reconciliation, which is strange because that's what this whole series is about, but that's a goal. That's our personal goal. But yet when we make that the goal for someone else, it's a form of controlling or coercing, convincing, convicting. And so our goal in this series is as best as it's up to us that we live our life with no regrets. That in our relationships, we have no regret about the work that we've done to prepare a way. We should never set a goal for another person. We can hope and dream about reconciliation, but we don't want to push an agenda. And the other thing that's really important for us to differentiate is when it comes to reassembling or fixing a broken something, a, a plate, a, a, a computer, a bicycle, uh, something that we've purchased, we usually have access to all the pieces. We can control the process, right? We can, we can stop and come back later. But when it comes to dealing with people, we don't have access to all the pieces. I don't know every part of their life. They don't know every part of mine. And so we don't have control over the process, but we do have control over our side of things. See, the four C's, they, they're difficult because they assume that we have control, which we don't. We have control over all the parts, and it's frustrating when it doesn't work out the way We'd hoped. And so we have to remember, we're not a bicycle. Uh, we're not trying to fix something that we've purchased. We're fixing relationship with another human being. It's difficult. It's complicated. And so the goal is to live with no regrets in our relationships. The goal is to do everything in our power, everything that we can think of, to keep the door open. 
to make sure that emotionally uh, we've removed every obstacle that we could possibly remove. And, and that we've done everything that we can do to take the pressure off the other person so they don't feel the need to use those tools that we go to each and every time. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is the point in my own sermon where I tense up. Maybe you're thinking of a person or persons right now that you have a pretty rough relationship with. And uh, like many of you, I've been harmed in relationships. That's part of life, right? That's part of encountering people that are different than us, that have different values and priorities and perspectives, right? We tend to, to clash in areas, and it can become harmful when we lean into these really unhealthy ways of encountering one another, of controlling one another. And so I've had friends that have uh, said horrible things about me that have harmed my family. I have uh, a family that have walked away. I have uh, co-workers that have done uh, horrible things over the years to get ahead, right? And maybe you've had these experiences as well. We, we have no shortage of those difficult relationships in the world we live. And, and I know there's many of us who have had unbelievable hurt at the hand of someone else. And, and this is not a free pass. And so don't hear that as... Uh, you just forgive and let them get away with it, right? This is not a free pass. That's not what I'm talking about. And we're talking about doing the work within ourselves so we can live re without regrets. So as, as best as we can, we take on the ability to, to say reassembly begins with me. It begins with what I can do, what I'm in control of. And so even if it's 100% the other person's fault, even if they're the one that walked away, if there's going to be a chance of reconciliation, there's going to be hope for repairing a relationship. The process that begins with us. We can only go so far, right? When we, when we go to a certain point and we stop, we get stuck. And maybe you're stuck in that place right now. You're, you're possibly feeding your own anger. You're reliving that situation over and over again. You're winning those imaginary arguments time and time again, right? Aren't those great? Those arguments in your head, you win every time. You say the right thing. You leave people speechless. We can be feeding that over and over again. And, and many of you know we uh, support here a uh, recovery community, Narcotics Anonymous community, and, and they have these uh, amazing steps, these 12 steps, these t 12 traditions that shape and form how they encounter people. And the first step I think is really important. I, 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 would, um, I would encourage anybody to check out this, this program. It, it really is a way for us to be reflective in our own lives. We all have stuff going on. But the first step is surrender, surrendering to the process. It says this in recovery, step one is admitting that we are powerless over our addiction and our lives have become unmanageable. And for some of us, the relational hurt has become unmanageable. It's taken over our thoughts. It's kept us up at night. But they go on to say this. If you're not willing to go the distance, if you're not willing to, to give it your all, they said the most important thing for you to know about your reservation for stepping into this program is that by keeping them, you're reserving a place in the program for relapse. By hanging on to reservations, by not stepping fully into it, you're actually saving a spot to fail over and over and over again. For you to relapse in this relational repair encounter. And so as best we can, can we set aside our reservations? Can we surrender to what I'm going to call the first decision in this process, this path to reassembling relationships? It's a commitment to make this decision once and twice and over and over and over again, and it's this, I will get back to, not back at. I will get back to a person and not back at a person. And this is what it looks like to have the same attitude that Christ had with others. He was always getting back to people instead of getting back at them. Our, our scripture this week comes from uh, the Apostle Paul, and he, he's writing to uh, Christians living in Nero's Rome. It's actually a pretty horrific place to be if you're a Christian at this point in time. Christians are persecuted, they're meeting in secret, they're, uh, they're being tortured, uh, they're being uh, beaten, they're being killed, they're being martyred. And all this is going on, and there's this community that's gathered, and they're struggling in relationships. And as best we can tell, uh, Paul has never met any of these people. 
Uh, and uh, he's giving them very specific relational instructions for how people should go to meet each other, be in community. And he's sharing with people he's never met, which is great news for us. Amen? Because he hasn't met any of us either. Because we would all tend to say when people give us this kind of advice that, well, you don't know my life. You don't know my experience. You don't know the situation. You don't know what this person did. You don't know what I'm navigating. And Paul jumps past all that. He leans in because he's helping us try to navigate this question that is our, our humanness. It goes beyond who we are as people. It goes beyond kind of these snapshots in history. He's asking the question, what does it look like to embrace the mind of Christ when it comes to relationships, especially the ones that are difficult, that are broken? And he starts off Romans uh, chapter uh, 12, verse 9, says this. He says, do not pretend to love others but really love them, which means uh, there's no faking, right? We've all had that experience where we've seen someone that we just really couldn't stand, and we smiled, and we acted nice, and we thought, man, this is horrible, right? This is horrific. Uh, there's no pretending, Paul says. There's no acting like uh, this person hasn't harmed you. Maybe it's a, a family or a friend or a coworker, but you're pretending. You're putting on a smile, and you're acting like everything's fine, but this person's maybe taken They've offended you or hurt someone you love. And Paul says it's almost impossible to love them sincerely when you can't face this thing that's preventing you from being in community, genuine, real community, from really loving one another. And Paul's saying if you're struggling with this, you have some work to do. He says, hate what is wrong, but hold tightly to what is good. And he's telling us to reallocate our hate. Now, we don't, we don't hate people, right? That's small, that's petty. But sometimes we hate people, right? And, and Paul is saying uh, that hate that we have, he says, you need to reallocate. You need to make the decision uh, to hate what happened. To hate the situation, to hate the... The, the outcome, the, the relational damage that's there, but not hate the person. Make the decision, I'm, a, I'm not going to hate the person, I'm going to hate the consequences of what happened. I'm going to hate that relationally things are broken. I'm not going to hate the person, uh, but I'm going to decide that I'm going to hate a what and not a who. And, and when we make that shift, we begin to see how we can navigate these relationships in new ways. When we take a step aside, Paul says when you do this, you, you start removing obstacles. You're leaning in, you're making a, a new way forward relationally. And he says, uh, now, now once you do that, it's easier for you to see and cling to the good that's in front of you. Can you imagine a world where the, the people that have done uh, horrible things to you, that you can uh, love them in a way that you can actually see some good in them still, right? Right? We can get in that relational uh, place where uh, nothing the other person does is good, right? They're, they're always wrong. They're always messing up. They're always uh, destroying things. They're always making a big deal. They're always difficult. And Paul says when we get in that place, it means we have some work to do. He says uh, to love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. So to honor a person is to put them first. So you say, you're, you first, your problem, your issue, your comment, your observation first. See, these are all things that we can choose that are in our control. We can't control what people do and change what has happened. What we can do is we can make choices, healthy choices. And that's what Paul is encouraging us to do. He says, if you choose to honor the other person, you put the other person ahead of your pride and your ego, right? They come first. And when, uh, when they come first, uh, you stop spending your time trying to convince them or coerce them or convict them of something. And you spend more time trying to understand them. To say, you first. Let me hear your side. And Paul presses even further because Paul is not giving up on this pursuit. He says, Bless those who persecute you. Do not curse them. Pray that God will bless them. And maybe for some of us, it's hard for us to really think about a person persecuting us 
right? That idea of someone wakes up every day and they're out to get us. They, they want to steal our ideas. They want to put us down. They want to undermine us, they attack our credibility, right? But maybe you have a person in your life that it feels like that. And Paul's saying we need to be so proactive, so proactive that he wants us to bless those who persecute us. He says, I want you to compliment them. I want you to encourage them. I don't want you to talk about them the way they maybe have talked about you. He says, because we're Jesus followers and we should embrace the way Jesus encounter people relationally. He says, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. And Paul's pointing out something that is pretty common in our world today, that when those that hurt us are in mourning, it should not make us happy. When those that uh, we struggle with fall, it should not be celebrated. He says, if you find yourself internally celebrating someone else's failure, if in your mind you think that's a good thing, that's a win for you, Paul says, you have work to do. He says, I want you to refuse to celebrate the hurt that is happening to someone else. He says, it's almost impossible, almost impossible for someone that's hurt us or betrayed us to be loved if you celebrate when they fail. He says, this is the tension that we have access to. This is the part of the relationship that we can control. We can choose to make a healthy choice. And, and this is the tension where God wants to work in our lives. Paul says, live in harmony with each other. Do not be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and do not think you know it all. The four C's are about being proud, about thinking that your way is the way. That if everybody would just listen to you, if they would do what you say, if they would see the world the way you see it, then the world would be a better place. All relationships would be repaired. But that's not how the world works. He goes on to say, Re uh, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone sees that you are honorable. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, has uh, this quote. And he says this about forgiveness, this idea of going to the places we don't want to go. He says, forgiveness goes beyond human fairness. It's pardoning those things that cannot be readily pardoned at all. And this is the tension where God meets us. And so Paul is writing to this group he's never met. And he says, it, it isn't about what's happened. It isn't about me or them. It isn't about this situation. It's about how we follow Jesus relationally. Paul never met them. He, he never met us. But he's speaking to something in our world that's beyond our time period, that's beyond our cultural norm, that's beyond legal matters. The drive to get back at someone, the people who have wronged us, the, the ones that have done damage in our lives is in our human nature. It crosses every boundary that divides us. It crosses every time period, and it makes us do crazy things, like thinking we can control other people. Uh, but it's the will of God, and the life of Jesus shows us it's the will of God to get back to people. That relationally, that's where God ultimately wants us to be. And we live that out the best we can, the way Paul is describing it. We can begin to show others what it's like to experience that grace, to experience a love that goes beyond understanding, to experience a group of people that's more willing to commit to the idea that I will get back to relationship instead of back at a person. Now, this is a decision we need to make over and over again, I'm, and I'm speaking to myself here. It, the powerful thing about this decision is that you will make it intentionally over and over and over again. You'll make it intentionally that you're not just going to get back at someone that's harmed you, but you're going to get back to them. If you commit, you make the choices that you can commit, this decision will make sure that you don't go halfway and get stuck. Halfway in reconciliation, we know just by watching the life of Jesus, halfway 
is I forgave. We get to a point where we just say, I forgave, and we sit back and we wait. Maybe we wait for that person to get justice. Maybe we wait for that person to fall. Maybe we're waiting for that person to realize we've cut them off, right? That's halfway. That's halfway. But Jesus says the full connection is when we can get back to people. And and this is a, a better way. This is the way that Jesus lived his life. Those that did all kinds of horrific things to him. Those that followed him. He's always trying to get back to them. And so uh, today, as we, as we wrap up this um, message, I want to give you a, a prayer that may be helpful. Uh, maybe this entire uh, morning, you've had a person's name or a, a multiple person's names come to mind. If they're sitting next to you, don't signal, right? But maybe there's someone that you have uh, kind of this relational stuff with. That there's brokenness, that maybe there's silence where there was conversation, there's distance where there was closeness. And you're trying really hard not to step into those uh, relational tools of convincing, convicting, coercing, right? Controlling someone. And so I want you to to fill the blank in on this short prayer. I want you to pray this as many times as you have to. Heavenly Father, help me see blank. Help me see this person or this group of people. Help me see them the way you do. Help me feel towards them, whoever it is, what you feel. Uh, There is a way in, in this life for us to care for people that have done horrific things. There, there is a way in this life for us to show the goodness of God in a broken world. Instead of getting and again, it's not a free pass. It's not a ignoring what's happened or setting things aside. There is justice in this world and we'll all experience God's justice at one point. But I am confident I am not the one who is capable of dealing justice in this world. And so I leave that to God. So I encourage you. Ask God, help me see them the way you see them. Help me feel towards them the way that you feel towards them. Let's pray. God, I thank you that we can gather in this way, that we can be in community together. God, I'm thankful for the diversity that is the church, the connection across many demographics. And God, I know as we come together and find out we are distinctly different people, sometimes the first step is division. Sometimes the first thing we do is reach for those tools to manage relationship. And so God, I pray not only in this community, but as we go about our day, as we encounter friends and family and strangers, that we would make every effort to get back to relationship and not get back at those who have done wrong. God, we thank you for this series and we just ask that you would bless those names that have come to mind. The ones that have done harm in our lives, the ones that have kept us up at night, that have made us angry, the ones that have been hard to love, God, we pray that you would bless them. Help us to see the world as you see it. In your name I pray. Amen.